Welcome back for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. Glad to be back here with you again. It's hard to believe it was 20 years ago, as we speak right now, that a coalition led by the United States invaded Iraq and the launch of Operation Iraqi Freedom. And thus do the current events of one day become the recent history of a later day. And um, for those of us who lived through this time, to see it now become the stuff of history um, is kind of a sobering and um, interesting thing. But there's a lot of looking back going on right now, I've noticed about the um, Iraq war, uh, a lot of rumination over um, the rationales for going, uh, hindsight, um, opinions about it, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today we're going to see it on the eye level of the young men who are there on the front line. Courtesy of our author and our guest today, who is an NBC correspondent embedded with the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment, the storied 3-5, as they entered the fray and embarked on the road to Baghdad. This is a um, frontline story that you normally get from being there and it's a very vivid narrative, and it really shows what these Marines go through. They're on the ground in the sands of Iraq. So joining us today is former NBC News correspondent Chip Reed. Chip, thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, it's great to have this article in the magazine uh, in honor of this 20th anniversary and these Marines who fought there. Um, it's quite a story, um, and it's the kind of story I feel like you can only get from the, in the vividness of it from having um, been with them there um, as they trekked across on the way to Baghdad. So why don't you um, tell us a little bit about what happened? This is their first con combat on the road to Baghdad that this tells okay. about, and it's a, quite a um, gripping story, actually. Yeah, it is. It's uh, uh, And keep in mind, uh, the very, very few people in this battalion, in the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, 3-5, had experienced combat before. Uh, and so it, there was a lot of uh, eager anticipation and nervousness and, and here and there a little bit of dread that they knew they were going to have a major ambush at some point. And on this particular morning, and I, I might have to refer to this now and then, this is my little, <laughs> this is the calendar I kept when I was, when I was there. I'm sorry about show and tell here, but it's a- uh, Oh, I, look at that. I kept a That's reporter's card. notebook, folks. That's what it really looks like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm very low tech. I still keep a calendar like this. I don't do it online. And, and, um, but, on the morning of March 25th, um, they woke up and a lot of them had a feeling and th 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 this was the day. Uh, five days into, uh, into the war, uh, they crossed the border on March 20th and that this would be the day uh, when they would uh, be ambushed in a very big way. And they were right. Uh, they were ambushed in a very big way. Uh, it, it, Brian Shantash, uh, who was then a lieutenant uh, was uh, in the passenger seat of a Humvee right behind the three or four, there's debate about how many tanks there were ahead of them, right behind the three or four tanks that led the way. And uh, he was the first person to notice something. He saw a berm somewhere around 30 to 40 yards to the right that looked like it had just recently been constructed. So he radioed the tanks and then he radioed the, and probably the same radio call, also the um, command vehicle, which was back in the battalion a ways, a couple of hundred yards or something like that. This is a long battalion at times. Uh, it stretched out to over two miles, but uh, on this day, it was more condensed, but it's still a very long battalion, a very long convoy. And uh, he notified them that he thought something was imminent. And at that moment, at that moment, uh, they started getting fired upon on both sides, a little bit from the left, but mostly from the right. And there, it was mostly Iraqi soldiers on top of this berm. And right behind uh, the Shantash vehicle, which has the five uh, Marines who I talk about in this article, right behind them was another uh, Humvee uh, driven by a guy named Scott Smith. Uh, and in the back seat behind him was a Navy hospital corpsman, a devil doc. Uh, and somebody 
an Iraqi ran up to the side of their vehicle and fired an RPG, a rocket propelled grenade. It went right through the side of this very thinly armored Humvee. Um, it went between the wind, front and back windows, right through the door joint. And, and I saw the, what it went through afterward. It was like going through. A <laughs> I mean, it was, it was uh, terrible how, how unarmored, how, how not up armored they were in the beginning part of this war. So at that moment, an Iraqi ran right to the side of this second Humvee behind the tanks and shot an RPG that went right through the very thin skin of this Humvee, hit uh, Frankie Quintero, who was manning a missile launcher. Stand, he was standing up in the back, on the floor of the back seat, ricocheted off of him, did serious damage and almost killed him, and hit Michael Johnson, a hospital corpsman, a devil doc, uh, in the head and either killed him instantly or he died very soon thereafter. I've gotten conflicting reports uh, on that. You know, in the, in the fog of war, you, you get a lot of, uh, of interviews that conflict with other interviews and I just have to do, did, I just had to do the best I could and I would, I would make clear when things were, were fuzzy. So a, as medics were rushing to help Frankie Quintero, who now goes by Frank, but Frankie Quintero, uh, and um, trying to see if there's anything they could do for Michael Johnson. Um, in the first hum Humvee, uh, Brian Shantosh, Lieutenant Brian Shantosh, had an instantaneous decision that he had to make. He couldn't go forward. He was trapped in a kill zone because the tanks were blocking his way because they had turned to confront the ambushers. And he couldn't go backward because the ent entire battalion was blocking that route. There was no sense going left because there was a berm there and nowhere to go. So he decided to drive right into the mouth of the dragon. He, he ordered his driver, Armin McCormick, to turn to the right and floor it. And that's what Armin did. As he did that, uh, machine gunner uh, Thomas Franklin, uh, known as Tank because he's built like a tank, uh, so told me his response was, quote, are you effing kidding me? But he never stopped firing. Uh, it, I was later told by Armin McCormack, who sometimes wa was manning the 50 caliber machine gun in that Humvee, that that he was uh, the tank was the best in the entire battalion. Thank God for that, because he cleared the way. So they roared across this little piece of bumpy desert with Robert Kerman, who is just 20 years old at the time and had just joined this Humvee that day, hanging on like a bucking Bronco rider back there, baby, barely able to hang on. And he uh, said that uh, he didn't understand what they were doing, but he was all for it, whatever it was, because he was out to prove himself that day. He had just been transferred to 3-5. His father had been in 3-5, and that's one reason they transferred him. And he said, my reputation was the new guy who couldn't do anything. So whatever they were going to do, he wanted to be part of it, and he wanted to be right up front and, and, and deal with it. So as they're driving toward this berm at top speed, and it's not very far, it's a matter of seconds, and Franklin up top is clearing the way with the 50 caliber machine gun, and Shantosh sees a little dip in the berm. This berm is, if you look at the article in Naval History Magazine, you can see a picture of it. In fact, I'll show it to you now if that's okay. Here's the berm. There's the berm. A photographer, John Makeley, with the, with the Baltimore Sun was there, and he got that photograph. It's not a high berm, but it was enough to cause real problems. This was a little later after it was no longer uh, completely covered with Iraqi shooters. Um, but what, there was a little dip in the berm, and Brian Shantash said, go through that dip. So McCormick steered the vehicle through that dip and went, crashed it into a gully, a ditch on the other side. Uh, Shantash and Kerman and McCormick all jumped out uh, as a lieutenant. <laughs> uh, Shantash only had a handgun. So he grabbed McCormick's M16 and took off down this ditch filled with Iraqi fighters who were so stunned to see them because the last thing they expected was somebody to come in from the rear like that, that they, they barely got any fire, shots off. So they went chasing down this ditch behind the berm 
And in a matter of five to 10 minutes, they wiped out this enemy force, uh, partly because they also had Franklin firing on the 50 cal. It was difficult for him because he was, they, they were running so fast and uh, firing at the, at the Iraqis who were firing at them and chasing out of this ditch, the Iraqis who were running away, uh, that it was hard for Franklin because he didn't want to hit, he didn't want friendly fire. He didn't want to hit his fellow Marines here. So he was like trying to send psychic messages. He said, I was saying, you know, I can't shoot right now. You're telling me to shoot here, but I can't because I don't want to hit you. <laughs> so this went on literally for no more than five, maybe 10 minutes. This part of it, they got about 200 yards, 150, 200 yards down this ditch. Not one of them got shot because they they went on the offensive so quickly uh, that the Iraqis just didn't even have a chance to respond. As they got too far down the ditch, Shantosh realized, that, as he put it, the geometry was bad because they were now running parallel to the convoy, but in the opposite direction that the convoy was going. So the bulk of the convoy was now just on the other side of that berm, and they were undoubtedly coming over to go over that berm, just like these guys were. And they didn't want them to uh, be shot by their fellow Marines who were who were coming over that berm, not knowing what was happening on the other side, other than that there was a lot of gunfire. So Shantosh said, let's get out of here. Let's get back to the Humvee. So they sprinted back toward the Humvee and Kerman was a little bit behind the other two. And Kerman was the best rifleman in his, uh, in his boot camp. He was a, uh, he was a, a real target practice uh, uh, hero in his, in his uh, boot camp. And he, uh, he looked behind him and saw that there were five Iraqis chasing them. And so he he screamed, F this S, because he was just mad at it for whatever reason. He got down into the prone position. He wasn't going to be shooting from the hip like Shantosh and McCormick were. Uh, he got down in the prone position. He took careful aim. He took three shots, and he missed them completely. Well. Turns out he had a different F, uh, M16. He had picked up somebody else's M16 in this melee. So he figured out right away that the sight was off a little bit. And what he had to do was aim at their knees to hit them in the chest. With five shots, he took out all five of these guys who were running to chase them, who were running toward them. They then got back in the Humvee, um, had a little discussion about how wild this was, and then realized that their main assignment was not to be doing things like this. It was to be protecting the tanks from ambushes. But uh, in this moment of crisis, they had decided they needed to make this maneuver to get behind the Iraqis. But they rushed out of there and caught up with the tanks and got into another battle uh, farther up the road. They were then called back from that battle because the artillery was about to start launching a barrage on the Iraqis in, up there. So reluctantly, Shantosh said, you know, I'm worried that these guys that we could kill in the next five minutes are going to be here when we come back through here uh, and they might kill some of us. But he, so he tried the best he could in the time he had, the minute or two he had left to uh, finish off that battle. And then they came back uh, to where the bulk of the battalion was. And they discovered that not only had they killed about 20 or more people in the ditch on the other side of the berm, but there were also 30 or 40 other Iraqis who had been killed uh, on the main road there uh, because a lot of them scampered over the berm and right into the arms of the Marines in the, in the main, main body of the battalion. Uh, and there were also about 100 injured and numerous uh, taken prisoner. So it was this uh, amazing moment, uh, really uh, felt like a moment. Uh, it, it's amazing when you talk to people in who have been in combat that for some it felt like hours and for some it felt like seconds. Uh, and for some it felt like both hours and seconds. But uh, so they um, they went back and then... Uh, and, and, you know, this was such a key moment, uh, the very first combat for all these guys, uh, uh, 
their fellow Marines who were in awe of what Shantosh and his uh, crew had done. Uh, Shantosh was awarded a Navy Cross. Uh, McCormick and Kerman, who had also run down the trench with him, were awarded Silver Stars. Uh, I mean, they just put themselves right out there. There, there were so many Iraqis who they were up against. Uh, it's astounding that none of, that none of them were uh, uh, injured or even killed. Um, but it was the quickness. It was the quickness of of their movement that uh, that that allowed them to be uh, unscathed, basically. And then also. Um, Franklin, who was on the 50 Cal, got a commendation medal. And uh, Ken Cordy, who was the radio guy, who ended up taking a couple of very senior officers prisoner uh, back at the scene uh, of the crash of the Humvee, uh, also got a commendation medal. Now, I, I beg to differ on one count with this because uh, in some ways, um, McCormick and the others believe that Franklin saved the day. Uh, he was so expert and he was being shot at. There was uh, sand and dirt flying up all around him from bullets that were landing around him, and he never stopped firing that 50 cal. Uh, he said, "I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna save myself in order to, uh, uh, I'm not gonna do anything to save myself. I need to save my guys who are down there in that trench, face to face with dozens and dozens, scores of Iraqis." Uh, and so, I, if I, you know, I, I understand it's hard to decide who gets what medal in the fog of war. Uh, but uh, Franklin deserves a silver, a silver, a silver star in this, uh, just like uh, McCormick and uh, Kerman did. So that's, that's they, all deserve, they all Pardon deserve me? our admiration. It's a remarkable narrative, um, especially when you consider this is their first taste of battle. What a clutch yeah. decision move on Lieutenant Shantosh's part. Yeah, and I do encourage all of you to read it in Naval History because you'll get a much clearer vision of exactly what happened than I just gave you. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's actually a gripping account. It really is. And and the, the, the decision in that clutch moment you're getting shot at, essentially for the first time, to be able to instinctively know that your best bet is to charge straight at them. I mean, that's the last thing you would normally do. And that's exactly why it worked because that was the last thing they were expecting. They were yeah. so caught flat-footed by what they did yeah that they just kind of rolled over them it's like they couldn't have done something better than that and yeah. for lieutenant chantosh to have made that decision in that key moment it's beyond admirable it's yeah. impressive and he, he certainly is well deserving of um, whatever accolades came his way um and it's it's the kind of thing that you never know how you're going to be right until you're That's there right. in that moment That's you right. can train for it forever and then that's right. It's amazing how many how many of the Marines told me the the same story that in combat was when they realized why they had trained to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over because it happened automatically in combat. Mm -hmm. So many people told me that when they had to reload, it was so automatic and so smooth that they were shocked at how good they were. And they said, wow. I guess it was a good thing we did all that training. It sounds and like they feel like they're watching themselves do it more exactly, than exactly, yeah, exactly. It was just happening by nature that because the marine, there's nothing like marine training. It's uh, and and there's one other factor here. One of the senior officers who the, the senior officer who actually oversaw uh, Shantash and his crew, um explained to me that there is something that they have drilled into them called the 70% solution, which is uh, you don't act when you have 90% certainty. It's too late. You act when you have somewhere in the vicinity of 70% of the information, sometimes a lot less than that. You just have to go with your instinct that you have developed from your training and from your common Marine sense. Uh, and that is, I, you know, I'm sure Shantash was not thinking about the 70% solution here, uh, but his training taught him you don't wait to be certain that it's going to work. You do it. They didn't have it's a second working. to wait. They didn't have one second to wait. They really didn't. They really didn't. Um, it's just remarkable to read it. And every time I reread it, I'm, I'm amazed by it again. So this is at the very outset of what becomes a protracted engagement over there. But um, who was to know that in March of 2003? Uh, That's right. That's At right. this point, we just wanted um, these boys to make it through safely and um, all that kind of thing. And uh, 
this must have like molded them in their lives and their military careers from this point on. You know, this is their very first experience, five days in country, um, they um, encounter an ambush and this ensues. So they probably were waiting for a fight and they certainly got it. Um, and they didn't they have to wait in, long, fact, did they? in fact, McCormick told me that be, initially when they first crossed the border, their first target was the, uh, uh, a field of GOSPs, gas and oil se separation plants. And they went straight to that on that very first morning of March 20th. Uh, and they they had been told, uh, the Marines had been told, rumors had spread around, who knows what was really official, uh, official uh, the official feeling here. But they had been told that it was possible that these in, this entire oil field had been wired. And if that had happened, some, one Marine told me there had been an estimate that one third of the Marines in this 1100 man battalion could have been uh, casualties, killed or injured. That did not happen, thank goodness. Um, but it was, a, it was a very tense moment. But then they had four days of nothing happening. And McCormick told me, I was bored. You know, when is this gonna happen? Uh, he said, the last thing you wanna do be in combat is bored because you might let down your guard, but I couldn't help it. I was just bored. It was like, when are we going to find somebody to fight here? Uh, and they found it. They found it um, on, on the morning of March 25th and they found it in a very big way. And their response was, was stunningly quick uh, and efficient. Yes, it was. So you um, were with them for how long in your embed? You were there for quite a while. I was with them for just under six weeks, which uh, I wanted it to go on. I it was this was without any question the story, uh, the the seminal story of my thirty three year career as a TV news journalist. Uh, nothing else made me feel like I had entered a different world. And nothing else made me feel like I had been picked up and placed on a different planet. Um, it was so different. I mean, I, as I like to say, I don't have a military bone in my body. Um, right before we went, my wife, tried, who was then my girlfriend, tried to talk me out of it. And she said, she said uh, we were walking, we were on a little quick vacation and she, we were walking along a beach. She said, uh, you can't do this with tears streaming down her face. I won't try to imitate her agonized voice, but she said, you can't do this. You have, you're 48 years old. You're, th these guys are less than half your age. You're, um, you have arthritis in your back and your knees. You have never even been in a fist fight, much less gone to war. She said, it's like Mr. Magoo goes to war. You can't do it. You won't survive. And I said, I've got to survive. I, I, I mean, I've got to do it. This is my job. And also, I can't wait to get there to tell you the truth. Uh, this is something I've never done. Uh, nothing. I never imagined myself uh, being in war and a real shooting war. And I wanted to cover this in the worst way. I hope I covered it in the best way, but I really wanted to cover this. And uh, so the first chapter of the book or the introduction, I think is titled Mr. Magoo goes to war, which, which describes the process of trying to turn me into an instant Marine as some of them called it. But I mean, <laughs> the thought that I could have gotten through booth ca boot camp at that point in my life is laughable. Uh, but here I was so lucky that I didn't have to go through boot camp. I didn't have to go through uh, infantry training. I didn't have to do any of that at all. I had to do was raise my hand and say, I want to go. And there I was. I was very fortunate. Well, um, yeah, story of a lifetime, one can well imagine. And you kept in touch with um, Chantosh and company over the yep. years, did you not? Yeah. You kind of started how this affected them? Some, some. I kept in touch with about five different guys. I did not keep in touch with Chantosh. I mean, Chantosh is hard. I mean, Chantosh just recently got back from rowing across the Atlantic. It's it's hard to keep in touch with Brian <clears throat> Chantosh. He's, He's you just always doing on that. He's always doing, yeah, that's my next book, baby. He's uh, always doing something that you can't believe. So he, uh, but I did stay in touch with several, including Sam Mundy, uh, who was the Lieutenant Colonel Commanding Officer of 3-5 in, uh, uh, in 2003. His father was the Commandant of the Marine Corps once upon a time, although when I mentioned that at one point, he said, who told you that? 
because sure. he didn't want to be judged on who his father was. He wanted to be judged on who he was and, and his accomplishments. And he was because he rose to three stars and he retired a year or two ago. And he's just a phenomenal human being. Uh, but he's the guy I kept in touch with the most. And when I decided to write this book, I called him and he put me in touch with several senior officers who went down to the lower and, and I worked my way down to the guys on the front lines because I really wanted to build this book primarily around the guys who were right on the front lines doing doing the shooting and, and having I wanted to talk to the guys who had buddies killed in combat and the guys who uh, who were injured and the guys who. Uh, came home with PTSD and the guys who came home feeling triumphant and, and used their Marine talents, their Marine bred talents uh, to survive in the civilian sector or uh, in their future careers as Marines. So I, I got a good cross section. I ended up interviewing 42 Marines plus several wives and grown children uh, and got a pretty good idea. I, I mean, if you want to get a pretty good idea of what it's like to be a Marine, in a combat frontline tip of the spear battalion, then come home and perhaps struggle in one way or another, but over the long haul to prosper. And to say, as every single one of these guys said, joining the Marines was the best decision I ever made in my life. They all say, oh, except marrying my wife and having my kids. But uh, they all, not there was not a single one who did not say it was the or one of the best decisions I have ever made in my life, even the ones who really struggled when they came home. And I developed such a enormous admiration for these guys, especially the young ones who, when they were 18 years old, uh, they were making life and death decisions like that. My biggest decision when I was 18 years old was who to take to the senior prom in high school. And, uh, and uh, I felt like you know, why do I have the right to even cover these guys? But uh, but I did. But General Mattis told us General Mattis was the officer up the chain from Sam Mundy. And he told us, uh, first of all, he said to uh, all of the embeds before we went our separate to our separate units, he said, he said, uh, if you're crazy enough to be here, you're welcome here. And he said, you need to act like Marines. Do not expect special treatment or special favors. Uh, you you will um, eat the same MREs everybody else eats. You will chew the same dirt everybody else chews. You will dig a ditch, which many of the Marines call a grave to sleep in each night. Uh, and he said, if you just act like a Marine, then they will, some of them will adopt you. Some of them will endure you but they will all accept you in one way or another. Wow. And that's what happened. Well, let's talk about your book. Um, this is a sort of um, opening uh, preview for readers of uh, your forthcoming book that um, goes into a much broader canvas of this whole experience. Yes. Uh, what's the title of the book? It's Battle Scars. And Battle Scars. Not, that and name it's forthcoming pop- later this year, correct? Yes, from Casemate Publishers. It should be out in uh, September or um Originally, it was scheduled for a little bit earlier, but uh, the publisher and I decided to put photographs in there, and that takes a while yeah. um, to decide to get away. photos from the Marines. And and also, there was a Baltimore, as we I mentioned, there was a Baltimore Sun uh, photographer, John Makeley, there who uh, took some fantastic photos, and we have to yes, decide which of his to to use. And so, yeah, it, it'll be out in in September, and I'll be going on a uh, tour to to uh, sign books and and do some TV interviews and such. And, uh, you know, I want my my main motivation here is I want to tell these guys stories. They want their stories heard. Um, a lot of these guys uh, came home and felt that uh, it wasn't like Vietnam. I'm not going to compare it to that. But a lot of these guys felt that they weren't sufficiently appreciated for what they did, putting their lives on the line. Elber Navarro, a sergeant who was one of the most is one of the most brilliant and eloquent people I ever met. Uh, put it this way, he said uh, when he came home, uh, w- America was not at war, or America is not at war. We're at war. America is at the mall. And not all these guys felt that way. Uh, quite a few did not really resent the situation, but but quite a few did. They just felt like this was a war people didn't care about. And uh, And I think it's important to tell their stories. And I wrote this down. Sorry to jump around here, but I went in August of, of 2022, last year, I went to a uh, 
a Marine reunion at Camp Pendleton, a 3-5 reunion where they climbed First Sergeant's Hill, a very steep hill at Camp Pendleton, and had a memorial, a very, very emotional memorial ceremony. You know, they say Marines never cry. Oh boy, let me tell you, when they're honoring their, their brothers in arms who were lost in battle, uh, Marines are not afraid to cry uh, and to feel a lot of passion for each other. Uh, but uh, while I was there, I went to the Memorial Garden at Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton, and there's a plaque there that uh, starts off with this quote. They say that a man dies twice, first when he leaves his body, and second when his name is spoken for the last time. I get chills every time I read that. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to keep their names alive. And I only talked to 42 but I hope this will inspire other people to write books, to do podcasts like this, to uh, write articles, to write their own stories uh, so that their, their sacrifice uh, is not forgotten. And that's, that's really what's at the core of this. And that's when I finally decided this is the book, when I finally thought, why don't I write a book about the Marines? I, I lost my job in August of 2021. There were cutbacks in the news business, and and I was one of the people who lost my job. I decided to write a book, and I couldn't think of anything. I certainly didn't want to write write about politics, which is what I covered for the most part. And when I thought of this uh, as a topic to write about, I said, "That's it, the Marines, uh, the Marines." I was embedded with then and now. Amen to all that, Chip, and they're worthy of our gratitude and admiration. But I think we all also, uh, we the American public owe a debt of gratitude to the war correspondents who let us know what really goes on there, like you've done. And like so many of your um, sort of uh, professional ancestors in the war world wars before you, uh, we, we know what we know because they, those cameramen, those reporters were right there in the thick of it, um, in harm's way. And um, a debt of gratitude is owed to you and your class as well for that. Uh, we look forward to your book. Um, and um, so be looking for that later on this year, folks, for more of this amazing insight from the ground level of what it was like for the Marines in Iraq 20 years ago. Uh, Chip, thanks so much for joining us. Um, it is my pleasure. Speaking with you. And I look forward to speaking with you again. And best of luck with the book. Um, we'll all be watching for it. And um, hopefully we can have you on again sometime. Thank you, Eric. I'd be delighted. When the book comes out, uh, I'm all yours. Yeah, that would be great. We look forward to that. Um, well, I guess that's it for us for today, folks. Thanks again, Chip. Um, thanks for joining us for another Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills. Until next time, take care.